Well, I'd like to talk with you about a new paper in the journal Biocomplexity that you co-wrote with Ola Herscher, professor of mathematical statistics at Stockholm University in Sweden. It's called A Single Couple Human Origin is Possible. Well, first, how did you connect with Ola, and how did the research for this paper come about? Well, as I recall, Doug Axe first mentioned him to me, and I have no idea how Doug heard about him. And then when I went to Copenhagen for a meeting, Ola was there, and we sat down in the lobby of a hotel and talked about the possibility of a model for starting with two modeling genetic diversity to the present. So this was the germ of a model for Adam and Eve for a first couple. And we talked about how it might go, what the variables would be. He was sitting there with his little notebook and his pencil, and I was suggesting variable after variable after variable, thinking I was giving him an impossible situation. Nobody could do a model like that, but there it was. And uh, that was the last I saw of him for several years. Huh. So you got to thinking, you were discussing, did this seem like an impossible task before? Well, I, of course, don't have the ability to do population genetics. I don't have the training. I don't have the math. So meeting him was fortuitous, and he was interested in it. So that was good. But then time passed and nothing seemed to come of it until the idea for writing the theistic evolution book came along. And it was suggested that we needed to do a model testing whether it was possible for us to have come from the starting point of two people. Hmm. And someone said, well, we need to have a population genetics model. And I said that I knew Ola, and Ola, when we contacted him, was interested. And he put together a model in brief order, and then we had to get it written and published. In 2016, it was published, and that led to the programming of it, which is now published again. Yeah. Well, the title of the paper is provocative, but also humble altogether. And I like that the paper isn't saying that a single couple human origin is certain or beyond the shadow of a doubt. We can't say that. Right. (laughs) It's only possible. So what's important about that distinction and that word possible? Well, nobody can prove it because mathematically you'd have to prove it. You'd have to show that nothing else was possible. And we can't do that. All we can do is show that it is at least possible that we could have come from two. And that's what we've done. We've shown that it's possible until such time as somebody else comes along and says that we are wrong. That's the way science goes. Yeah. We've put up a <laughs> we've put up a balloon and now everybody's shooting at it. <laughs> Well, in these types of studies, it's important to separate out what's assumed and what's clearly demonstrated. And I think you you make that clear in this paper. How how do you and Ola go about that with this research? Well, you have to be very careful in saying what you can know for sure, what your assumptions are, and to state the assumptions clearly so that everybody knows what they are. One of our goals in this paper was to make as few assumptions as possible so that those people who read it who weren't so friendly to the idea would know that we weren't trying to game the system. We weren't trying to sneak something on board to make it easier for a a couple to succeed. So the only assumptions we made were first, starting from two, and second, the introduction of what we called primordial diversity, which is... In one case, we introduced initial genetic diversity to the chromosomes in each individual so that they didn't start out completely the same. Then in another version, they started out completely the same. So you had both versions to test. So in one, in one case, it would be like twins, where they were identical, um, no genetic diversity. And in the other case, they were completely different, unlike each other. So that would introduce more variation in in the beginning. And I like to think of it as having diversity from the beginning so that as things unfold in future generations, there's more diversity to unfold to create new kinds of individuals, new strengths, new weaknesses, that sort of thing. Yeah. So those are the assumptions we made. The 
standard variables that go into every population genetics model, the population size, the mutation rate, the doubling time of the population, all those were fairly standard, and we explained what they were so people would know, and they were the same in both trials. So those were standard. Those were not uh, unusual. So what were the results? In the case where everything was the same at the outset, um, no variation, to get the amount of variation that we see in our current population, it would take 2 million years to duplicate the amount of variation we have now. 2 million years is a long time, but it goes back to the origin of the first Homo species on the planet, Homo erectus as he's called in Europe, or um, he goes by a different name in Africa, which I never can remember because I think of him as Homo erectus in Africa too. Then um, with initial diversity, it took 500,000 years. And that is about a little after the time of appearance of Neanderthals and Denisovans. So they appeared 750, 850,000 years ago. So What's the take-home message? Well, obviously those are times that are older than most people would like for the appearance of Adam and Eve, but that's not the take-home message that I would hope people would take. Remember the title of the paper was, It's Possible for Us to Have Come from Two. The message is not, It's Possible for Us to Have Come from Two People 10,000 Years Ago. Yeah. It's just that it's possible for us to have come from two. Now, the other part of the message should be that this isn't the end of the story. There are lots of things to uh, adjust and play with, lots of dynamics we haven't experimented with. For example, you can adjust the behavior of the populations. You can have uh, break it up into tribes. You can break it up into migrating groups that exchange breeding couples. You can break it up into more uh, multiple females to one male. All sorts of behaviors that we see, for example, in the Old Testament, could be modeled. That would affect the timing of the appearance of the first couple, and that needs to be examined. What else? Oh, well, we already know that if you change the starting population size, that has a negative effect on the time. If you change the mutation rate faster, it has a positive effect on the, the time. So you can go either way. So for example, if we were to make the mutation rate go four times faster, four times stronger mutation rate, that would drop the age to 6,000 years. Only problem is with a mutation rate four times stronger than it is now, most of us would be dead. So yeah, <laughs> we don't want to go there. So you're saying that some of the findings that you've come up with fit into the, the standard understanding of what could be possible as far as human origins. Yep. But there's lots to, to play with here, depending on what model or how you want to interpret it. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. There's room for shifting things around. Okay. Now, I, I should also say there is quite a bit of interest and opposition from other scientists. I've been yeah, I was all, ask week that. Long, yeah, all week long in dialogue, shall we say, with uh, scientists, population geneticists, interestingly enough, who have been offering their opinions and asking questions and digging into our model. And the latest challenge is underway right now. I've handed it off to Ola and we'll see what he says. They're out to see what they can do to disrupt what we say. And it's leading to some interesting questions. Um, what are the limits of what this kind of research can do? What are the limits? How much can you tell about what happened six million years ago from our genetic data? Can you say that there were four versions of a gene six million years ago, or is that lost to time? So those, those are all questions that need to be addressed. So since the paper came out, it's already starting to produce debate and additional questions, which is great. That's what, what science is about, right? But listeners, to read the paper for yourself, you can visit BioComplexity's website. It's www.bio-complexity.org and click on current volume. And I see the paper. They, they read the one on Evolution News first. 
Okay. Yeah, you've written you've written about this and some of the backstory on evolutionnews.org. Mm-hmm. So listeners, you can go there too to find out some of the information about this paper and how it was assembled. <laughs> 